You've all, you, you, you've entirely disappeared. Even your statue has disappeared. Uh, I don't know why. I, I can see it in mine. Oh, it is back on now. Okay, fine. Oh, okay. Cool. Folks, we are live. Uh, we are live and we are recording and uh, we are from, visiting us from the Roman Senate. Uh, Augustus uh, visiting us from uh, the Temple of the Flamins, Flaminis Maioris. And I'm, I'm, as usual, from New Orleans at the edge of Audubon Park. And uh, Augustus uh, just asked me, what is this show about? And obviously, it is about him. <laughs> uh, it is, uh, I mean, he is literally appearing today as, as a divine icon. And I think that we have to uh, get him and Awiele to discuss the significance of this divine icon uh, and, you know, address awkward questions like, why should devout Christians like me be talking to uh, retrograde pagans like you about saving civilization? Well, that's a good question to open with, I guess. Yeah, as far as talking <laughs> about me, I'd like to think that I'm an expert on the subject, so let's okay. get into that too. But uh, as, as far as why Christians should talk to some, you know, retarded, backwards, barbarian, pagan like me, I see it as like we are in a position where we're all in the same boat. Uh, from where I'm standing, Christianity washed over the pagan world and destroyed it in the same way that we see communism destroying our world right now. So when Christians come to me with, oh, no, the Antifa are tearing down our statues. Oh, no, they're teaching our kids this, that and the other in the classroom and they're turning our kids communists. I see this whole thing. This, this has already happened in my world. So I don't think we should be bickering anymore. I think we all understand this collapse of civilization happening right before our eyes. And we really need to get over that religious difference or we're all going to be crushed by this. I totally agree. I mean, and uh, as a matter of fact, I, I don't know if you realize this, but I have a PhD in archaeology uh, from a joint program in anthropology and, and history. And uh, I, I know exactly what you mean by the destruction of Rome and the, the imposition of Christianity and how much was lost as a result of that. And Absolutely. The, the, loss is, the loss is tragic and it was totally unnecessary, uh, totally unnecessary. And, and we are in a much worse position here right now because uh, the, the powers that are imposing us uh, on us right now are totally foreign uh, and we're in a, we're in a tragic situation but but how did you come to this path i've i've spoken to you exactly once before it was on uh, robert stark's show i uh, right and, that's right um i've wanted to talk to you ever ever since i think i mentioned to you i we tried to reach you all all summer while i was in florida uh, but anyhow, tell how, how did you get to this path, and 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 how and uh, Awila, you I want you to interrupt at any appropriate point and explain how your path is similar or different. Are we talking about the political side of it or the religious side of it? Well, first off, explain your icon appear your iconic appearance. Uh, you have the symbols of the sun and the eagle. Uh, and and a, a human figure. Now, who is the human figure? The Sol Invictus. The icon that, today is, that, is, is for a much more mundane. Uh, yeah, well, Sol Invictus is, I mean, the ancient god of Rome. And so, you know, I, so I, we share the same name. So, so this, is actually, this is Apollo? Uh, more or less, yes. The, the ancient solar deity and the sun, the uh, you know sun god was represented by an eagle or a falcon. Um, but I mean, the mundane reason for this is that you know my kids are asleep and I don't have video at the moment, so it's not a uh, not a grandiose well, statement or anything. <laughs> well, but I mean, it, it it is kind of your name. Well, that is true. And as far as how I got to that, uh, you know, the the religious question. Um, I, I was raised Baptist as a uh, kind of a compromise between a Jehovah's Witness mother 
and a Catholic father. So I was raised Southern Baptist. And, uh, you know, when I was 13, you know, in, in Baptist circles, well, in all Protestant circles, the Bible was literally true. And so when I sat down and read the Bible, found out there were some contradictions in there. I, I emphatically rejected Christianity and started reading on everything. And it was really paganism that called to me. And the specific sect of paganism was Thelema. Um, you know, for more, you know, I, I think people choose religions <clears throat> more based on their own prejudices and their own uh, proclivities in life and their own, you know, what they're geared for than it is any kind of search for objective truth. I think, you know, people who change religions and claim that it's based on objective truth, I, I think they might be uh, dishonest with themselves to a large degree. Um, Thelema and paganism really just spoke to me. They they chose me, I always say. I, I didn't chose word. them. I, I don't know this word you're using. Salima? Uh, Thelema. It's the Greek word for will. Um, oh, Thelema. <laughs> yes, yes, right. Thelema. Okay, now I understand. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's that's how I came to that. I was about 13, uh, found Thelema, and then here we are. Uh, most kids, you know, they go through their goth phase when they're 13, and they grow out of it by the time they graduate, but uh, I've been goth all my life, man. I never went back. For the for for those who might have been confused by all that, the word thelo means I want, I, I wish, I want in Greek. And so thelema would be the, you, you're basically saying that you, you, you worship the triumph of will. That's absolutely what it means. That, yeah, all the occult trappings, all the uh, cultural things, all the literary devices and poetry that Aleister Crowley wrote, uh, it all gets washed away when you realize that the entire religion is exactly that. It's a worship of the triumph of the will. That's all there is to it. Everything else is just bells and whistles. Well, that is quite interesting. And, and so you started, when, and so you were 13, you discovered the, the religion of I want. I wish I will. And uh, what, and how, did, how have you developed it since then? Oh, boy, that's, uh, I mean, that's the story of my life, really. I think it's fair to say. I, I always say that I'm religious first and political secondary, if not tertiary. Um, you know, I, I studied for years and years, um, all my teenage years. It wasn't until I was 19, though, because you have to be 18 in order to join the order. Uh, I joined the order in... Uh, my 19th year, and I became a uh, Minervan initiate. And then for the next 11 years, I was uh, an initiate in the order until my expulsion. So from that point, you know, the expulsion was because of a uh, religious pilgrimage that's now public knowledge, uh, where I walked to the Mojave. And then after that came the goat sacrifice, that's also public knowledge, and that resulted in my expulsion. And from then, I, you know, have been practicing on my own. Um, that's a whole different discussion, though, about you know how I've developed in Philema and how I've developed Philema itself since. Um, that might, I don't know how much of that I can even say on air, man. <laughs> well, uh, they're, they're gunning for us, but they haven't come, come, come to this particular spot yet. Uh, it's, it's very interesting. And so, uh, all right, uh, Awiyala, you're sitting there very quietly listening. Uh, are you, you, you've never described yourself, uh, in terms of Thelema, is that you regard that as your, your, your version of the religion also? Well, although I have, you know, knowledge of Thelema and I've studied it and actually was introduced to it at quite a young age as well, uh, due to my stepfather, who's very knowledgeable on the topic, uh, I align myself with Hellenic paganism, which, you know, and that doesn't cause me to necessarily feel alienated from Thelema because there are definitely some very similar principles that I myself do agree with and adhere to, uh, particularly regarding uh, the power of the will, uh, like Augustus was discussing. And if you remember, that's actually something I discussed quite recently in one of the lectures that I did on that topic, on the topic of spirituality and essentially uh, the entire idea uh, behind the gods and the various pantheons is uh, the assertion of that will and the manifestation of that will uh, through our communication with the gods and those gods being representative of the various 
uh, archetypes, if you will, of, of the human spirit and the human mind. And so in that sense, I do share a lot of very uh, close similarities to Lima. So it isn't so much uh, an issue of uh, whether or not you are you know, fully committed to this particular philosophy, because in polytheism, we do understand that we have a lot of similarities in our paths. And for that reason, that is something, you know, that I can say I'm, I'm fairly comfortable with because of the similarity to my own personal path. Uh, with that said, um, Augustus knows me quite well because he's been there since the very beginning of my own political journey. And our similarities are very, very prominent, uh, even in our personal lives and the development of our religious philosophies and that sort of thing, because I too grew up as a Southern Baptist in a, in a, just a kind of a traditional uh, religious household in the terms of uh, Southern Baptist beliefs and Christianity and mainstream uh, Christian beliefs and that sort of thing. And I eventually reached the same point where I felt that I was disgruntled with this interpretation of uh, the intrinsically literal fundamentalist perspective of Christianity. And that's essentially what caused me to feel alienated from it as well. So from that point, I went through a period of agnosticism and that lasted for quite a few years actually. And uh, just kind of wandering through various uh, religious ideologies and reading this mythology and that ideology and this and that and whatever. And um, it was eventually when I really started investing a lot of time in classical literature that I arrived at the faith that I'm at now, which I felt uh, most strongly and intuitively aligned to. And that to me was the faith that truly called me as well. So it's very similar in that regard. And I felt that, you know, there was just a very powerful intuitive force there when I converted to Helenism uh, about two years ago. So it's been a very fascinating development and path. And interestingly enough, I wasn't really aware uh, at the end of last year of exactly how I was going to develop my work into this year. But I had this kind of spontaneous revelation at the very beginning of this year that uh, my path would be going and taking a more esoteric uh, spiritual direction and that essentially all of my political endeavors are asinine if they don't possess some spiritual and cultural foundation and I truly believe that and that's what's inspiring me to go in a different direction as well and sort of intertwine my spiritual perspectives into my political work so that's kind of where I'm at as well. Okay I've got I mean I, I don't want to spend the, the whole night on this but how would you distinguish between your 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 religious approaches I mean uh, I, I have never actually, are you saying that there's an, Augustus, are you saying there's an order of Thelema? I mean, I, 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 I'm still inclined to put the accent on the first uh, for, first syllable. Sure. But. <laughs> yeah, we're very uh, Americanized pop culture pronunciation over here. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, there, there are certainly distinctions. I, I always describe Thelema as a sect. And a lot of Thelemites, they don't believe that Thelema is even a religion, let alone a pagan religion. I get a lot of pushback when I say Thelema is pagan because they think they're kind of, you know, above that or, you know, outside of that paradigm. I don't know what they're thinking, but um, that the order is definitely a rigid structure where there are rules and it's a, you know, it's an order, a religious order like any other. Um, I don't well, really... Some, some of our audience may be thinking that, you know, because you're on this show with me, when you're saying the order, you mean something other than what you actually not, mean. Yeah, not to, well. I mean, it is paramilitary, at least the structure is. But no, certainly not the robbing banks and you know getting to a radio show host kind of order. More like a monk order, a a holy order of warrior knights. At least that's what it was intended to be. I would vehemently deny that the OTO was that today. But uh, as far as the original question of what the distinctions are between my approach and a wheelize approach, I really don't think there are. I mean, like she was saying, you know, being polytheistic, it's not that we have to be right or that our approaches are even uh, shades of right or wrong. Like we just have different approaches. My approach is very much inclined towards ceremonial magic, ritual, uh, prayer, like, you know, ancient things like that, um, that are very, very hands on, very, uh, uh, ritual oriented. And I think a wheelized approach is more theoretical, philosophical, um, spiritual, uh, and not so concrete. So I, I, it's just different approaches to the same problem, I think. And I, I'm sure a wheelie will correct me if I'm wrong in that estimation. Well, a wheelie has been talking about the gods and their relationship 
to uh, sort of socio uh, cultural functions, right? I mean, uh, is that is that correct, Oila? Is that a, is that yeah. a correct representation? That you yeah, you, you see, you see the gods as basically symbolic of real of, of cultural reality. They are, but I also would expand and elaborate upon that because that isn't to suggest that we don't see the gods as being literal beings or literal manifestations because they definitely are. Uh, that's essentially just the basis of discussion that I wanted to sort of introduce to uh, my personal audience and my work because I think that it's something we really need to truly break down and discuss with people. Your sound is a little yeah. bit. Uh, your sound is a little bit echoey. I mean. Is there anything you can do about it? How does it sound to you, Augustus? Uh, I'm hearing her fine, actually. I hear you fine, but I, I, it's like she's she's got slightly a an in a in a in a in a barrel effect to me. It could be because I have headphones in uh, Bluetooth connection, so I can try to disconnect that and see if that's better. If you prefer, let's see. Let's just see how it works. Okay, give me just a moment. So, is that better? I think it is. It sounds more like you. Okay. Yes, it sounds more like you. Okay, go on. I'm sorry. You're fine. No worries. Um, but yeah, I was just saying that I, I feel like, you know, there's a bit of a contradiction uh, in a lot of the discussions that people have because they feel like, again, there's often this, this rigid interpretation uh, within their own personal philosophies regarding polytheism and that, that's the thing is the thing that I really want to emphasize is that again you know we share the same goal we simply possess different approaches to that goal and that doesn't make one goal intrinsically wrong or one of them you know better or whatever it's it's very much contingent upon uh, your own personal path and that's the most important thing but the gods definitely do have these representations of like I said the archetypes and the various you know primordial motivations and inclinations of the human mind and the human spirit. But again, something else that I've stated is that I do believe we do see the actual manifestations of those gods um, and they do convey themselves to us. And I've, I've often discussed with you as well. I think I've mentioned this, that they have given me literal physical signs and manifestations of themselves. Like it was not simply just a theoretical thing. It has been shown and demonstrated to me that there are actual physical signs and I'm a firm believer you know that what you worship will manifest itself to you it will manifest into reality and it will demonstrate itself to you so that's definitely one of the most important tenets of my philosophy as well can you elaborate on what, what some of these physical signs are and I'll, I'll share a little anecdote from my life when you're done <laughs> uh, well the most prominent actually happened at Charlottesville and this is this was the the truly concrete uh, illustration to me that that my prayers were being heard and that my efforts were uh, coming to fruition. That was the night before Charlottesville. I remember uh, just being in this meditative state and making this prayer to Athena and specifically asking her um, in Latin uh, for her armor, uh, what we refer to as the Aegis or the Gorgonian Aegis, which is of course the breastplate given to her by Zeus. Uh, that she put the the head of Medusa on after she was slain uh, in the in the Greek myths. She wore uh, the decapitated head of uh, Medusa on the breastplate to symbolize overcoming, you know, corruption and uh, all the, the degeneracy and all of those sort of things. And it became a very powerful symbol so that when you would imagine her upon the battlefield, it was like, in my vision, just seeing all of her enemies being instantaneously turned to stone, being terrified, being to know exactly what they were dealing with, to see the unprecedentedly powerful sacred wisdom that she possessed and that always inevitably led her to victory upon the battlefield to envision that is just such a strong thing. And that was the illustration that kept coming to my mind before Charlottesville was that we were entering a literal physical engagement against some of the most evil political aggressors that we're facing in the modern day. And so I remember specifically asking her in my prayer uh, for uh, the Gorgonian Aegis to wear that, to have that as a protective emblem over not only myself, but also those who were with me on that day. And I remember the day after that, um, the security team brought me this helmet 
and they had already told me they you what? that they they, they brought me what? the helmet to wear oh, during okay. the and I didn't really think anything about it at the time because everything escalated so quickly and happened and everything unfolded so rapidly. But I remember after, you know, all the chaos ensued and the next day uh, I returned home, I remember right before I actually presented the video that put me on the political map, essentially, the elaboration and discussion that I did on Charlottesville and what actually took place. I remember I was holding that helmet in my hands and I looked down at it and I was examining it and I flipped it upside down and there was a label on the inside of the helmet with the word Aegis inscribed on the inside of the helmet. Epic. And I, I just remember when I looked down at that and I saw that, the sheer amount of power that I felt in that moment, and it was conveyed in that video that I did regarding Charlottesville and just the, the passion that I felt was so authentic and so real. And that was the most powerful sign to me that she had been physically manifesting evidence that she was there and that she did lend us her protection and that she was with us and her presence was with us. And that was just such a powerful manifestation of that to me. That's probably the most powerful thing or one of the most powerful things I've had happen. And so, yeah, that's definitely just one example of, of how I feel the gods have manifested themselves to us. So I'm definitely a believer in that. Absolutely. Wow. That's quite a story. Um, Augustus, do you have any, do you have any similar uh, sort of physical uh, semiotic, semiotic stories like that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Plenty of them, man. I, uh, I don't know. I guess the most recent one, um, the one on the top of my head was uh, just a few months ago. Uh, my my son Odysseus was born in August, and just before that, <clears throat> I've been reading some uh, books. You know, I've been reading books all year. I mean, I was on sabbatical. I read a stack of books as tall as I was, and uh, we we named him Beowulf Odysseus Invictus. And uh, you know, one day I was reading this book that I just found. Uh, at random at a bookstore. It's called Ulysses Found. It's about a guy. Uh, he's a British sailor, and he spent 10 years going around the Mediterranean following the route of Odysseus. And, uh, you know, I, I had known, of course, you know, having read Tolkien and having read Beowulf and all that, I knew, you know, Beowulf means either the bee wolf being the bear, or it means the war wolf. Uh, there are different interpretations of it, but Odysseus is just the man of sorrow. You know, that's how I'd always thought of it. One day reading that book, I realized that, uh, you know, he, he goes into the explanation that the Roman or the Latin Ulysses is from a perversion of the Greek Ulysses. And Ulysses means the wolf. And so my son's name, like both names refer to the wolf. And one day I was reading this book that I had written uh, called Aeon. And it was a recording, a record of 30 days of visions that I had written uh, they were the, the original 30, vi uh, 30 visions that had sent me out into the wilderness when I went on that pilgrimage back in 2013. And in that book, uh, I was told by uh, the goddess that, you know, I will give you a son and his name will be the wolf. And when I read that passage back in, it must have been July or August, right before Beowulf was born, uh, that was one of those moments, like a wheel eyes saying, she looked down into her helmet and saw that word. When I read, I will give you a son and he shall be the wolf, that uh, that was a clear sign to me. I don't know. I mean, do do all, I don't know. I, I, it's, it's kind of strange that the, 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 name, the name or nickname wolf is something that runs in, runs in my family. I was... I was father son. I was father wolf, and my son was my whelp. And uh, one of uh, my great grandfathers who fought at uh, fought at Gettysburg, uh, he was he was called Wolf. Uh, is this is this an Indo-European uh, racial subconscious thing, or what? Uh, what what do you think? What what's going on? Do we, do we all just want to be wolves? Yeah, well, I reckon it's Odinic. It's Indo-European. I mean, it relates to Romulus and Ramus as well, who were raised by wolves. Um, I think it's, you know, pan-European, really, the entire wolf symbolism. And the fact that Beowulf's name is from Northern Europe, 
and Odysseus is from Southern Europe, from Greece. And many have postulated that Odin and Odysseus are like characters, the same archetype. William Pierce wrote about the Faustian spirit actually being also called the Odyssean spirit. Uh, that whole milieu there, yeah, I think it very much ties all of us together. But I think the striking thing is that it never occurred to me that the name Odysseus had anything to do with a wolf. Um, so seeing both of those names juxtaposed and then finding right before he was born, th this is going to be your son's name is what the goddess told me. That was what I found to be the striking thing. Wow. Um, okay, let's try to uh, bring this a little bit down to earth, so to speak. <laughs> Uh, when did you, or it, 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 it was it for, for, for either of you or both of you, was it always a matter of uh, relating race to religion or did that come later? I mean, is the, is the, is the identity of, uh, uh, in Indo Germanisha uh, uh, Urfolk, uh, that we're all descended from one one common uh, ancestors, Indo Europeans. Is is that is that like part of why you 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 went to the religion, or did you come to a, a racial consciousness after that? Am I making any sense? Yeah, I'm I'm hearing you. I'm just uh, I'm allowing a wheel eye ladies first, so. <laughs> she seems like she's looking for the answer, and I don't want to uh, interject and color her answer. Oh, you're fine. Um, I, it's interesting because I've, I've reached different levels, I think, of awareness regarding racial consciousness and acknowledging the importance of uh, our ethnic identity. And, you know, so it's something that I was aware of, but it's something that has been expanded upon and developed tremendously uh, since my conversion to my faith, and now I consider it obviously, you know, one of the most uh, intrinsically important parts of it. So honestly, it's something that I don't think can be separated. Uh, it's something that can't be truly appreciated in all of its profundities without acknowledging, uh, I think, the uh, the ethnic identity behind it. And so I think that, you know, it's something that I was aware of, but it's something that I've developed more of an appreciation for. And if you've noticed the development of my writings, it's something that's become essentially the forefront of a lot of my political philosophy. And, and it's just considered to me just an invaluable part of the discussion. And we can't truly discuss uh, the political elements of the modern world without addressing that issue. So it's something that yes, I was aware of and something I acknowledge, but it's something that I've developed upon and something that's become just incredibly important in my own work, uh, not only politically, but also spiritually as well. Absolutely. Also yeah. what? Not only politically, but also what? But also spiritually as well. Spiritually. Yeah. Yeah, I have, uh, for my part, um, I think mine was more instinctual than anything else. I, I never thought of anything much in, uh, in racial terms. Um, the, I always explain to people, you know, in the discussion, the Christian versus pagan discussion, that uh, Christianity is a foreign religion to the European people. Uh, it came into Europe. Like, paganism is what is tied with blood and soil. They had family gods. They were gods according to localities. So if you're talking about being a nationalist, certainly a, an ethnic nationalist, paganism is the way to go. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, that came later to address your original question because you know when i was growing up as a pagan it you know the racial thing didn't really factor in except unconsciously instinctually because you know one example i might give is uh my firstborn son his name samael uh you know which as an anti-christian might be like you know it's it's an anti-christian statement to name your son after the chief rebellion uh, the chief rebel against God. Uh, my daughter is named Jezebel, which might also be seen in the same sense um, as an anti-Christian thing. But really, uh, it's more counter-Semitic, because if you look at the villains of the Old Testament, uh, they weren't anti-Christian, and they weren't anti-morality or anything of the sort. Uh, they were anti-Jewish. And I think that's the interesting point. I never thought in those terms, but as you know, I grow up, as I get older, as I'm more exposed to the real world, 
Um, and as I leave behind, you know, being opposed to Christianity and become more and more uh, embracing of actual paganism and what it means, uh, you realize that it's, it's essentially pro-European. It is for your own people, your own history, your own tradition, your own geography, and it is necessarily antithetical to hostile foreign invaders. So I don't think it's even a, necessarily a, a you know, racial hatred kind of thing. It's just uh, paganism is the religion of my people and nothing else is. Mm, okay. I mean, this is problematic on many levels, I, I guess, uh, for me in particular. But let's start with one of the probably one, what you're least expecting me to ask you about. Your daughter's name is Jezebel? That's right. And that's an interesting thing, too. A lot of my life is lived uh, in accordance with the concept of kind of uniting the dream world and the waking world. Uh, my daughter's name actually came to my wife in a dream. Uh, a lot of things in our lives came in dreams, uh, but my daughter was named Jezebel Isis in a dream. So uh, we didn't know we were having a daughter. I mean, this was uh, years before she was born. Uh, my wife said, I'm going to have a daughter. And I had a dream about her and her name was Jezebel Isis. So when she was, you know, when she conceived and then we found it was girl, Naturally, that's what we named her. Well, uh, one of my best, it's an interesting combination of names. Uh, one of my best friends here in New Orleans' name is, is Isis. Uh, but hi, Isis, if you're watching. Uh, anyhow, uh, I wanted to know, though, I mean, what does Jezebel mean to you? And I mean, it's uh, what you, you, what, what does that name mean to you? I mean, what, uh, it, it, I was going to do some deconstruction about Idris and the armor of God and uh, with, uh, with Awele a moment ago, but uh, what does Jezebel mean to you? And what, what, do you, what do you know about Queen Jezebel? Uh, well, I'm sorry, it cut out there for a second. I, I thought we had paused. Um, as far as the name, you know, the, the whore of Baal or whatever, you know, the, the Jews named it. I mean, that, whatever. I, I mean, the story is what's important to me. So when God sends Elijah and Jezebel beats Elijah and he has to run away and then God sends Elisha and then Elisha is the one to take her down and then she's fed to the dogs. It demonstrates that the racism of the Jews, I mean, these, these were emphatically Jews in Israel who had a foreign queen uh, who was a pagan uh, from the land of Tyre. And so she came in, uh, she was, uh, who knows, um, you know, her, her capacity for ruling as queen, but we can only assume she was good at her job if the Jews hated her so damn much. So she had to die. And I think that symbol of, you know, this sort of royalty, this pagan royalty uh, that is so hated by the Jews, that's, that's how I see Queen Jezebel. So not oh, yeah. as a... Uh, a bad person, but as someone vilified by bad people. Really, any thoughts on uh, Queen Jezebel, wife of King Ahab? Well, I think that Augustus makes a very strong point, and I've never exactly thought about it in those terms, but honestly, that illustration is quite telling because of the fact that if we put it in a historical context and compare that that story to actual historical events of the Jews demonizing other uh, faiths, other traditions of other ethnicities, especially uh, the antagonistic attitude towards uh, the intrinsically European uh, ancestral paths of heathenism and paganism, it's very accurate. So I've never exactly thought about it in those terms and considered it under that light, but that's a very, very strong point. And I think that it illustrates a lot of the ailments that we have faced in European civilization from the antagonism that we have endured as a result of the Jews simply demonstrating that they're, you know, going to be absolutely as destructive as they can towards European culture. Well, I mean, I, I, Augustus, why do you say that, Jeze that Jezebel, that, is she, that, that, that her opponents were Jewish as opposed to Israelite? Uh, well, I don't believe in Christian identity, if that's what you mean. 
I think. No, I wasn't. No, I'm talking about in the in the book, the books of Kings and Chronicles. Uh, you know, she is she is uh, expressly queen of queen of Israel. Uh, right. Well, she married into that position, though. I, she was uh, from Tyre. She was Phoenician, so she was a foreigner, and that's why they hated her. Uh, unless uh, you, you know, you know, want to correct me on that. I mean, do you do you understand what Elijah's name is? Perhaps not. I, I'm not sure where you're going, so maybe not, man. <laughs> okay, well, uh, here, I, 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 again, I, this is part of the archaeologist in me talking, I guess, but uh, more than anything. But uh, Elijah's name me is an argument. Elijah's name means uh, El or Elohim is Yahweh. It's an equation of two two concepts of divinity and saying that they're the same. The words mm -hmm. El, uh, I, I don't know if you're aware that the, the reason why so many things are repeated in the book of Moses, the five books of Moses, uh, is because they're Elohist texts and they're Yahwist texts. Uh, mm -hmm. And basically they, you have this parallelism where uh, in, the, in, the original, in the original Septuagint, the original uh, uh, Paleo-Hebrew, um, you have rep repetitive texts where uh, a god named El, or sometimes the plural Elohim, is the is the actor, and sometimes you have Yah or Yahweh, the the, the tetragram Y H W H, uh, is uh, the is the actor, and and that's why there are these rep repetitive pa passages throughout Genesis uh, and and other parts of uh, of the the, the, the Torah, uh, and. Basically, uh, there was a tremendous, uh, from the standpoint of archaeology, there's, there was a tremendous conflict uh, that came to a head around five or five or six hundred BC, uh, where monotheists basically got the political upper hand in uh, in Israel and not for all practical purposes, knocked out the original Hebrew religion. The original Hebrew Israelite religion was really identical to uh, the religion of Tyre and Sidon, the Phoenician uh, relationship. They, they, they had a different tribal God. They, their tribal God was Yahweh, the, the four letters, uh, the four lettered God. And um, the uh, Jezebel, was a follower of Queen Asherah, the, the goddess Asherah. Uh, have you, are you familiar with the, that term, the, the, yeah. the Asherim? Uh, is that Ishtar and Inanna and that whole Exactly, lineage? exactly. That's the, that's the Western Semitic uh, version of, uh, of Inanna, uh, Sumerian goddess, goddess of love and fertility. Um, and you know, you, you have you have exactly one direct reference to uh, that in the entire Old Old Testament, where in Ezekiel he he speaks of the the tragedy of the women who who weep for Tammuz, uh, Tammuz being Dumuzi, the the consort of of Inanna Ishtar. But Jezebel was basically an advocate of the old religion, and it wasn't an ethnic fight that was going on so much as it was this monotheistic revolution that was taking place uh, between uh, the Elijah, whose name is an argument, Elohim is Yahweh, El, El is Yah, uh, and uh, he, he was trying, and they were trying to suppress, I mean, bas and basically there were very sound political reasons for this. Uh, they, it, uh, polytheism uh, typically doesn't result in a good, in, as nearly as cohesive uh, a political philosophy as as monotheism, which I think explains a lot about why it was adopted uh, in the later Roman Empire when the Roman Empire was kind of falling apart. They needed the political advocacy of a single god, and. Um, I, I, I just, I, I mean, I'd like you to look at some of the source, sources on the original, the, the oldest texts that predate the Bible 
are from like ceramic inscriptions and wall paintings and things. And the very oldest Paleo-Hebrew texts that have anything to do with religion uh, refer to Yahweh and his Asherah. And so the so Yahweh, uh, the the God, he, in in the oldest texts that we have, he is actually referred to as having a wife. Uh, and the Jezebel right. was part was was devoted to that religion. So um, right. And that, I, I, that I, makes I, sense. I, and I, I know that. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying, I, I, Sorry, I didn't I, mean I, it's interesting. I mean, you're, you're using it as sort of a metaphor for uh, the modern Jews, but the modern Jews, I don't think had, had really crystallized uh, at the time that Elijah was fighting Jezebel. Yeah, granted. Um, and I, I think that's, that's fair enough, but I think if you look to the Old Testament and you look to the actions of the Jews today, I don't see much difference. Um, you know, like Leal I had said, like Jezebel is only one example. Look at, uh, you know, the entire civilization or high culture, as Spangler would put it, of Babylon. And when people think of Babylon today, uh, it's, it's the slander that has lasted for 2,000 years. People think of Babylon as the ultimate evil, you know, the, the center of all pestilence, uh, when really the only reason we think that is because the Jews were slaves there and they hated it. Uh, in reality, Babylon was a very enlightened place. It was at the high culture of the day, uh, and much of what we have in the modern world actually comes from Babylon. I mean, our, our order of the planets, the names of the planets, uh, the seven days of the week. Uh, a lot of things have their root in Babylon, and we hate it because the Jews hated it, and they immortalized that in the Bible, uh, Old and New Testaments. And Jezebel is just one of those examples, but I mean, you could go on all day about the, uh, the things that were vilified in the Bible. Um, and again, looking to the modern day, certainly I, I agree with you that the Jews did not crystallize until a certain period after the consolidation of all this. Uh, but if you look at the tactics, uh, I mean, just think of, I don't know, Hollywood villains. Um, they do the same thing. Like, why is Bane a bad person? Because anybody who were to act as Bane would be antithetical to what the Jews want. That's why. A lot of these Hollywood villains, they, they fill that same kind of character of the whore of Babylon or the Antichrist or anybody who stands against Jewish interests or the, is the Israelites' interests. They, they seem pretty <laughs> parallel to me. I, I can see we're going to have to have several several conversations. We're not going to cover everything in one, but um, I'm interested in... in I, I've spent a lot of time in Los Angeles and Hollywood, and pop culture is one of my one of my uh, one of my interests. Uh, what are you saying about Bane? <laughs> well, I love Bane. Bane is one of my uh, my personal favorite supervillains of all times. Okay, uh, and why is he why is he particularly anti anti Jewish? I mean, that's thought well, never hit me. The law and order aspect, I mean, obviously, you know, the total annihilation abs aspect, possibly not. But the fact that that relates to apocalypse, I think, is is very much in the same vein. Um, but I think the the fact that he is antithetical to corruption, that he wants to wipe out corruption. I mean, the League of Shadows really is is the underlying theme here. Bane is just the face of that, of this uh, society that wants to rid um all of human organization from corruption and they will burn it out if necessary. Batman or Bruce Wayne stands as this uh, kind of bulwark against true justice, kind of like Harry Potter in the, uh, in that series, you know, Voldemort wants to establish order. He wants uh, muggles and the magic folk not to mix or interbreed because he wants the magical folk to be powerful. And JK Rowling set this up as this direct, analogy to hitler and the league of shadows is the same way they want order they do not want corruption and they will kill anybody who gets in their way and they'll destroy uh, all forces of corruption and that is why they are villains to these people in hollywood are we alive your thoughts well as soon as you brought up harry potter we're like in, definitely in a realm of uh, my uh, interest in the discussion because although I love listening to all this, I'm like, yeah, that's my topic. Um, so I take a, a very yes. similar perspective, and, and it's true that you know a lot of the villains that we demonize uh, only 
we only demonize them due to the fact that that they are villains within the minds of this one particular individual, this one particular character who really has a very um, pseudo moralistic intention who may often, as Augustus said, stand in the way of legitimate justice. And it's, it's a very fascinating thing to explore. And I, I mean, again, you know, if you look at a lot of the political connotations of these different like series and different stories, whether they are, you know, like within the realm of like Marvel or something like that, or whether it's more like fantasy, like Harry Potter and what is being demonized, what is being criminalized, you know, what essentially the idea that, you know, we are different and we are separate and, and, you know, this idea of tolerance and this, this idea of multiculturalism and all of these things that are essentially being uh, advocated for is what paints these characters as being evil, as being criminalized and demonized, and as being essentially the villain. So it definitely puts things in a different perspective when you consider all of those connotations that come along with a lot of these stories. So it's it's very fascinating, for sure. So, okay, I mean, you two are actually the first people I have met who want to talk about Harry Potter. And <laughs> I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of pleased because I have been saying for years that basically this is a, a serious propaganda work. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, elaborate on that, so, uh, because I mean, do you think that, the, did, they, did they plant J.K. Rowling? Is that, is that why she became the richest woman uh, in, in the world? I mean, that she, that she basically agreed to uh, sign on to this agenda of, uh, Racial purity is the most is the most is the is the the blackest magic of all. Yeah, I mean, I think she's explicitly said that Voldemort is a direct analogy to Hitler. I, I mean, she makes no bones about it that this is what the story is about. But we realize and the expert the and, and very specifically that the British aristocracy loved him. Right. Right. The exactly. So Great Britain loved him. Yeah, so you see all these characters like uh, like the Malfoys, for instance, that support Voldemort, uh, and those people are the cowards and the cruel people. Uh, they're terrible character, you know, all the happy people who are good people. Uh, they're all the Weasleys and the the uh, Muggle mixers and all the professors the who teach. Blood. Yeah, the mudbloods. Like, I mean, I love Hermione. There's no secret that I would marry Emma Watson. But at the same time, like, these people are set up as the moral exemplars for a reason. And that's because they push this this uh, agenda by Hollywood. And, of course, Emma Watson now does it in real life, which is very yeah. frustrating. Terrible tragedy. Tell Absolutely me about it. Terrible. What's interesting, of course, is that the Weasleys are they are pure bloods but they're pure bloods who basically support the destruction i guess you'd say of purity oh doesn't right. that sound familiar right and those people are held up as the virtuous those are the moral exemplars of the age and anyone who opposes them anyone who says no the old order should be instituted and you people are destroying the magical world um it, it goes to show like the fact is, man, when you're using that analogy and you think about it rationally, if there is such a difference between people with magical powers and people who do not have those, the muggles, why in God's name would you want to dilute that magical blood and all of those powers and everything that comes with it? I mean, it would seem outright suicidal. And the fact that they say this outright, that they want to destroy this, really goes to show you just how well, balls out. I, I can't think of a different word for it, but how balls out they become about this agenda. Very interesting. Well, I'm. Uh, th that brings up an, another, in, another uh, a totally different point. Uh, what do you, with regard to the uh, uh, rear guard actions to try to preserve Britain, maybe it's too late. Uh, what did you all think about the vote today in the House of Commons? Augustus can speak first on this one. <laughs> uh, I haven't heard of it, honestly. I, last I heard, uh, they were talking about 
uh, voting against Brexit. Is that what happened today? Well, they, they voted against uh, Theresa May's plan uh, by the largest uh, margin in modern times. The the large the government lost by like 260 votes, uh, and I think the the previous record for a government losing uh, a vote was 160 uh, mm -hmm. in 1924 when Ramsay MacDonald uh, was showing partiality towards communism. Uh, and um, the, it, 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 it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ethical uh, event, but if you all haven't been keeping up with it, okay, we, we, we'll talk about that tomorrow. But I think it's, I, I, I was thrilled when Brexit, uh, when they voted for Brexit, I, I thought that was one of the most exciting events in, in recent history and uh, that the British Parliament, uh, the Conservatives and Labour have stood up to Theresa May on this one. Uh, is is pretty impressive too because I think that everything she's been doing is a total fraud, uh, and she's she she's basically been trying to have a non-Brexit Brexit. Brexit. <laughs> right. Yeah, I can't really say the things I think should be done in Britain without getting you banned from Facebook. So I'll let a oh, wheel. Can can you can you speak metaphorically about them? Come on. <laughs> We, we we are we are daring here. Uh, we, uh, we we one, one as OELA knows one of one of the goals here is to set up our own uh, our own network at some point. So uh, if that if that get, gets hastened rather than slowed down, uh, you know, uh, we, I want to I want to hear what you have to say because you know we we have taken some very radical positions here. Okay. Well, speaking in metaphor. Uh, when the League of Shadows found that London was corrupted, they set fire to it. <clears throat> I believe it was 1666. And uh, when Gotham became that corrupted, then Ra's al Ghul came to, uh, you know, liquefy the city, basically. So I would use a League of Shadows metaphor on this one because it's totally fictional. And I would never, ever suggest that anyone do anything like the League of Shadows would do. Well, how about V for Vendetta? I don't really, man, let me tell you. <laughs> I, uh, I have become pretty cynical over the years about mass movements uh, and about the, not even just the intelligence, but the will and the intelligence of the common man. I, I don't know. I'm more Evolian in the sense that I think an aristocratic group needs to be the vanguard on this one. No, nope, it was just one 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 spark caught uh, caught fire in V for Vendetta, I guess. But they did they they did do pretty pretty good number on the Houses of Parliament. Um, it's all very interesting. Uh, to does it bother either one of you that uh, ancient paganism? had no concept of race at all? Uh, not really. I mean, I think of it the same way as the Constitution. I mean, it was basically unspoken. You know, the founding fathers didn't feel they had to say, uh, by the way, maybe we shouldn't bring in 30 million uh, Arabs to uh, run for office. I, I think it was pretty much understood, like, we have our country, right? Like, we know what we're doing here didn't need to be put on paper. And I think paganism is the same way. You didn't have to say, hey, guys, uh, how about we make this temple of Jupiter and we'll put some Ten Commandments on the wall there that say uh, no Africans. Like, it didn't need to be said. Like, they are not Roman, period. Uh, I don't think the Celts needed to say, hey, man, we should probably put up a, a sign outside of uh, this uh, oak forest here that says no Chinese allowed. I, they, that concept would never have crossed their mind. So I, I don't think it's necessarily a failing. Maybe in retrospect, it would have been a great idea. But, um, you know, what? they're different worlds. So I, I don't think we could really expect that. It's kind of like putting our prejudices off on our ancestors. I agree. Well, I I guess, uh, here, here's the other question then about, about that. And I think I've raised this with a wheel eye before, but raise it with you. Which was the greater civilization, Rome in the 
time of Augustus or Italy in the time of Michelangelo? Ooh, man, I don't know. Have you seen The Third Man with, by Orson oh, Welles? Okay, Orson Welles is one of my favorites ever in, in cinematic history. Uh, in The Third Man, uh, long story short, there's this monologue where he's talking to the guy that finally finds him, and Orson Welles says, you know, in Italy for 30 years, you had bloodshed, murder, betrayal, all the, you know, orgies of destruction, and in that 30-year period, you had Da Vinci, Michelangelo, uh, the Sistine Chapel, all these great works of art. In Switzerland, you've got 500 years of peace and democracy. And what have they produced? The cuckoo clock. So I think, you know, and my, my son's name is Cesare, uh, after Cesare Borgia. So I'm very partial to that era in history there. But I don't know, man. That's a, a good question. And as far as the religious aspect, I'd point out that, uh, I mean, what they were deliberately, consciously, and overtly trying to do was resurrect paganism in Rome. So I, they I think trying, they, were, they were trying to resurrect the classical form of art and architecture. I don't know that they were exactly trying to resurrect paganism. They were trying to resurrect the reality, the, the natural form and the appreciation for human beauty. That's fair. I think many of them probably were, but I would say Cesare Borgia was probably doing the real thing and probably a couple others around him as well. But yes, fair, fair point. I'll cede to you on that. Uh, there certainly were people trying to resurrect the form and possibly not the substance. And what, when you're talking about Cesare Borgia, you're basically uh, saying that he was having orgies. <laughs> well, there was that, <laughs> but I, I think more, more, you know, essentially, uh, what he was doing was trying to resurrect that grandeur of ancient Rome. I mean, his uh, his his personal motto was Caesar or nothing, and uh, I think he he meant that in the most fundamental way. Okay, could you elaborate on that a little bit? I mean, what, what do you what what do you think he was trying to do? I mean, the the amazing thing is to to read about just how unchristian the popes of that era were. And of course, that, that gave rise to the Protestant Reformation uh, because they were behaving like anything other than uh, poverty, poverty dedicated clerics. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Borja family was the epitome of that. Uh, they've gone down in history infamously as being the, the family of the orgy and the murder uh, they, they were known for assassinating their rivals with poison. Uh, that's what they became famous for. Uh, but I, I think it was uh, certainly for Alexander and for uh, Cesare, it was, it was a little more profound, a little deeper than that. Um, and certainly there was, there was a cross-cultural thing between the paganism and Christianity when you see that uh, you know, Cesare was the, the model for the image we think of when we think of Christ and his sister Lucrezia uh, was taken as the model for the Virgin Mary. So there was certainly, uh, a, you know, their, their father was the Pope. I mean, you can't get away with that. They, they were emphatically Christian. Um, but as far as Cesare personally was concerned, uh, I see his, his quest to conquer Italy uh, as a, a direct uh, attempt to relive the glory of Rome, certainly uh, under Julius Caesar. And to become Caesar himself in that modern era. Awila, which was greater, Rome or the Rome or medieval and Renaissance Christian Europe? <laughs> um. So this could be a very lengthy discussion, first of all. <laughs> we, we've only just begun. We, 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 tonight, tonight does not have to be the end of the story at all. You and I have several unfinished stories that we've started. We do, we do. And, and I believe we've actually discussed this topic before. And, and honestly, I, I mean, you, you know pretty well my position on this, I think. But oh God, where do you even start with this? Where you, there's so much to, so much to discuss. 
Well, let me let me take it where I start with it, and okay. then you all can react to that. Where I start with it is that the Roman Empire uh, was uh, for, for 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 all its glory, it was a very short-lived phenomenon, and it is more. Uh, it, its greatest successes were in the things that grew out of it rather than itself. I mean, maximum extent of a Roman Empire was approximately 117 AD, maybe 120, right in there. That's pretty much when it goes from, from Britain to Iraq uh, and the, the deepest penetration into Germany. Uh, and then it starts shrinking and falling apart. Uh, and the Roman Empire became Spain and, Brit and France and Britain and Germany during, under Christian leadership and under Christian uh, society and ideology. And from the st launching pad of medieval Europe in the Renaissance, we conquered the world and it was under the cross and under uh, Christian kings that we became the rulers of the entire world. And uh, to me, it's that, dom that's that world domination that we're losing right now and that our enemies uh, so desperately want us to lose and basically, if we were, if it were, if it were humanly possible to retreat back to the boundaries of Europe, uh, they might let us survive. But that isn't practical because our civilization has reshaped the Americas and Australia, and whether they like it or not, India and large parts of Africa. And so, only by totally destroying us can they get rid of our legacy. So my, my interjection here would be that um, the relatively short time that we're discussing in terms of, you know, the preceding events of, of the development of the Roman Empire and the consequences there, and that notwithstanding, the spirit that was dominating European thought during this period of time, what you're discussing in terms of conquest is arguably, I would say, and I believe Augustus would definitely agree with me on this, it's an intrinsically and inherently pagan belief. It's a pagan perspective and a pagan passion adopted by Christianity uh, during that conversive time uh, through that transition from a predominantly pagan world into a predominantly Christian one. I definitely would argue that this spirit, uh, as you discussed in Rome, the civilization itself and the history there notwithstanding, the, the spirit that was perpetuated through that the, uh, the ideological ideals, the philosophical notions, the spiritual perspectives that were created during that period of time is essentially the foundation for all of European civilization and all of our successes and conquest and all of our ideals and, and all of these things that we're fighting so vehemently right now to preserve in Western civilization. So arguably, I mean, the discussion of Christian expansion is definitely something that needs to be acknowledged. However, the basis of the philosophy that drove uh, those passionate expeditions and those passionate ambitions behind those expansions are inherently pagan. And that's what all of this comes down to, I think. And I believe Augustus would definitely agree with me on this. But that's essentially, I think, where our perspectives really coincide here, because that is the fundamental foundation of the Western spirit. So that is what all of it comes down to, I think, in I mean, how do you distinguish between, I mean, it's interesting, how do you distinguish between race and religion? Between, what was that? Sorry, I broke up. Race and religion. I mean, in other words, uh, what you're saying to me is that the Indo-Europeans, the, the Indo-European peoples, any way you look at it, were a people of conquest from the very beginning. You know, the, the best evidence is that it was probably a group of people on the southern steppes of Russia, who expanded east, west, north, and south, uh, and created the, you know, from the whatever the original Indo Indo Germanish or Heimat was, uh, and from that Ur Heimat, 
uh, they created the civilizations of Europe, India, and the Americas. And uh, that was the people. And was it was it was it not their blood uh, more than the religious form? And didn't didn't basically Christ? I mean, what is it, is it is it possible that our spirit is in our blood, and that religion is a be- the, the Christian religion is a better organizing principle? I guess is what I'm asking. I think that taking historical context into consideration during that period of time, I can acknowledge and understand what you mean when you say uh, in terms of organization that Christianity was very efficient. And of course, at that time it was. At this day and time, however, as we've seen society progress into the state that we're in now, I no longer believe that it possesses that same efficiency. And that's that's the problem, I think. With I mean, it, 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 it goes. This goes into a very extensive and complicated discussion as to whether or not the actual the actions during that period of time, particularly regarding conquest and all of these victories that we possess and the expansion of European culture and philosophy and all these things, are these values, are these principles that are found to be inherent within Christianity or are those principles that have been borrowed from paganism? That's a very interesting uh, okay, question. Okay, well, let, let's look at it from the, uh, you're, you're talking about conquest in Christianity. How about uh, negative conquest? I mean, it seems to me that right now the Western Europe and uh, the Americas are faced with a Muslim invasion, uh, a non-Christian, an anti-Christian invasion. Uh, and yet we were faced with that in the years uh, 700 to 1700. Uh, and, it w- and very consistently Christianity saved the European race. Those actions definitely need to be acknowledged, but but my argument is not so much with those actions, but the ideological consistency of those actions. So are those actions actually consistent with what is taught in scriptural doctrine, doctrine and practice? That to me is where I find a contradiction because this is this is within the very spirit of paganism, this, this demeanor and th- this insatiable desire to preserve what is ours and to vehemently fight against anything that threatens it. But with Christianity, although these actions have been performed in the name of Christianity, and of course that should be, you know, honored and acknowledged here, I I still adhere to this belief quite firmly that that this is a demeanor that was formed and born within paganism, within pagan ideology and philosophy, which is of course, as we know, the foundation of our civilization, but those have been extended into Christianity to provide it, I think, that fervor and that same demeanor to be able to preserve our demographic and our culture and our civilization. But again, is, is it scripturally consistent? Because I don't find it to be in terms of Christ's own teachings. And that's where we, we run into a dilemma. But again, this is very much a scriptural debate more so than it is, you know, just discussing all of these things all of these events in terms of just historical context. So it's kind of two separate conversations, but it's definitely one that's worth having, I think. And that's just, again, my own personal um, sort of uh, scruples with Christianity, I think, more than anything. So that's, that's a little bit of my own perspective coming in there. But I don't okay. know where to go. Uh, 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 oh, yeah, like, have you ever gotten an email from me? I think one or two, possibly. <laughs> possibly a thousand. Okay. Uh, what, 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 do you remember what I happened to write, uh, write underneath my signature? Yes, I've seen the scripture that you, you have on your email. Yes. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am, set, I am come to set a man against a variance against his father and the daughter against her mother, and the, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be those of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he that lo- loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life shall find it. Isn't that a fairly militaristic statement? 
Well, here, here's the problem with that is that Christ spoke in parables and we know that he even discussed this with the disciples and their uh, lack of understanding that what he said was not literal, but metaphorical. Again, this is also why I have my own issues with Protestants because of the grossly fundamentalist and literal interpretation that they have of, of scripture. But again, I interpret Christ's statement regarding that he came not to bring peace, but a sword as a representation, as a metaphor, as a parable for the intrinsic opposition that Christians were to face uh, regarding others that did not agree with them ideologically, which is quite true. However, if you try to interpret this as a literal militaristic call to action, it's also directly antithetical and in contradiction with his other teachings regarding uh, essentially the pacifism that he advocates in other places, even towards one's enemies. And essentially, something else I would expand upon there is that this, this statement regarding the family essentially being split apart, to me, emphasizes an inherent antagonism towards our traditions in terms of familial bonds, because it simply states that this is your hyper-individualistic path, and we're going to disregard all familial bonds, which is also confirmed by other instances in Scripture in which Christ disregarded his own family and essentially said, you know, whoever believes is my family— but, but to disregard familial bonds, to me, uh, is a, an offensive notion. <laughs> it's something that I, I disagree with vehemently. So that's just one point of disagreement that I have. But, but, but again, the notion of losing our life in order to save it, to disregard this existence in, in favor of the preservation of one that is beyond this world, to disregard physical existence and all of the values that we possess in this physical world in favor uh, of a supernatural world, to me, is in essence a desecration to all of the endeavors that we have in this realm of existence. And one of those is, of course, the physical reality of race and ethnicity. So uh, that's just my own perspective and, and how I perceive that scripture. And of course, uh, any you know person that, that adheres to scriptural doctrine in Christianity would be pretty upset, I think, with what I just said. But that's just honestly how I perceive it. Uh, and Augustus is free to jump in with his thoughts on this as well. Uh, yeah, I've got lots of thoughts, man. I, I think <laughs> going back to the original point uh, that Mr. Lincoln was making is that um, I, you know, I'm willing to <clears throat> agree that, you know, Christianity was a unifying force that allowed European civilization to conquer the world in a way that, you know, the worship of Jupiter in one place and Odin in another might not have. But I agree with the wheel eye that at this point in the game, I just don't think we can, I don't think there's a return to that. Um, I mean, I, I think a lot of people will become disillusioned with it. And I, I don't know if it's realistic to want to return it. I mean, I have tried, man. I like, I'm technically still Catholic. They've never excommunicated me. I'm still a Knight of Columbus, believe it or not. But I uh, just spiritually, they're, everything in me uh goes against uh that that kind of you know playing the game pl making a charade of it uh in order to to execute a political agenda i mean i just can't do it and i think a lot of people are in that same position um as for another uh strain here uh mr lincoln i'd like to talk with you off air actually to get a reading list from you about uh certain things concerning archaeology uh, but one mm -hmm. book I would recommend uh, to you, if you haven't read it yet, have, have you read Nature's Eternal Religion by no, Ben Class? Okay, no. he was the, the founder of the uh, Church of the Creator, which is like actual racism. But uh, it is also one of the best uh, critiques of Christianity I've ever seen. Um, his relation of Christianity to communism, uh, the roots of both being Judaism, uh, I think he lays it out better than anyone I've ever seen, but he does it in a very polemical fashion. Uh, but much of what he says, uh, actually a wheel I just said, um, he just goes on for a couple hundred pages about it. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of re reading, uh, reading lists, I know I've asked a wheel a million times about Georges Dumazil. Are you familiar with Georges Dumazil? No, I've never read his work before. I know the name, but I have never read him. This might inspire you to read him. Um, May of, of 1940 uh, was a time when a lot of people were leaving France uh, for other, other, other shores, either the Americas or going through Casablanca or um, 
just trying to get it across in boats to uh, England. Uh, Georges Dumazil returned from exile uh, to Paris uh, upon the occupation. And um, his work is dedicated to understanding the basic structures of Indo-European religion and society. And um, anyhow, he, he survived. Uh, he survived the, the reconquest and the event of events of 1945 and uh, can, remained very prominent and active in, in French uh, classicism and anthropology until he died in 1986. And um, his concept of the Indo-European gods is almost word for word what Aouyalai uh, likes to talk about, the, the social functions uh, and the values uh, uh, of the gods. Uh, and you see, I feel that we are, that, that racial reality is very deep and that a lot of our personality is in fact related to wanting to be wolves. I mean, that's one way of putting it, that we, we, we have lived in close proximity with wolves. We, our society is wolf-like and, you know, wolves have basically evolved to be our best friends. Uh, in the form of dogs. Uh, it, it's a very interesting symbiotic relationship. But I think that there is this way in which the Indo-European people have always been a people of conquest and that Christianity is the best engine discovered. Uh, whether it was invented by uh, Semitic peoples or not, uh, the, the Semites, the Semitic people, never conquered anyone except other Semites. Uh, they, they, they never, they never set out to conquer the world. Uh, and not by, uh, huh? not by force. Well, I mean, by, by they conquered by other means. By trickery is. Uh, is a uh, uh, is a totally different di different thing. I mean, I'm just saying that we have the physical reality of of our our will is in our blood, and I mean, I I, I guess I just I feel like I, I mean my my personal history is that you know. I, I, I grew up with these ideals of the of the the medieval the medieval church, the Gothic cathedrals, uh, and the Renaissance. This is this, these are the highest achievements of our people, and this is the world that gave birth to the, the Spanish Empire, the, the the Spanish and Portuguese Empire, the French Empire, and the British Empire. And we are now basically being asked to divest ourselves or even erase every relic of what we achieved in the past 500 years. And I think that, you know, if, if we, if we can't, I mean, it, 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 I guess I, I see a huge contradiction is what I see. And I mean, okay, I was going to tell an anecdote about, uh, uh, I was talking about the ages and, uh, you know, the, the symbolism of, uh, of the armor. And I wanted to ask her how, how she felt that, that Athena armors, how does, how does Athena's armor compare with one of, one of Paul's light motifs, which is the, the armor of God. I uh, hold that thought. Uh, because I guess, I feel like our family and our race are so closely related. My grandfather uh, was a very, very devout Christian, but he was a very well-educated man too. And he was, uh, I guess for Texas, he was a fairly eccentric guy. Uh, he had a, he had a, some sort of eye allergy or something. And so he often ended up wearing a patch over one eye. And he was a very tall guy. 
And in terms of one of the more horrible days of my life, he died in Dallas, Texas, February the 18th of uh, 1980, which happened to be the day before Mardi Gras. And I was busy here sort of you know, celebrating Mardi Gras. And uh, the message that came to me when he died was delivered by a flock of ravens uh, who came down on uh, my then girlfriend's uh, little little red red convertible and almost smothered us. And I was very confused. Uh, and she said immediately, he died. Fascinating. He was he he was a Christian, Odin. Never miss, never miss, never missed a Sunday in church, but he was he he looked like and acted like Odin, Wotan. And ravens came to tell me that he died. That's interesting. Yeah, I think uh, what you're saying about the the relation of blood is really paramount, and I I can't disagree with you at all. Uh, one thing I would liken this whole conversation to is maybe the Soviet Union, you know, where what a wheel is saying is accurate, that I don't think it was uh, Christianity that can be credited for the rise of the West uh, for medieval or Renaissance culture. I, I think it was the people. It was being European that made that. Like if you look to the Soviet Union, I don't think you could credit with a straight face communism for getting the Russians to the moon. You know, I don't think you could credit communism or the Soviets for somebody like Prokofiev. I think that's clearly their blood that made this happen. So oh, yeah. I am in agreement with you um, as far as the real underlying source of all this is the blood. Uh, but that's, again, that's why. I think uh, paganism is is the best relation to it because it recognizes that, uh, whereas Christianity is a universalist religion. Um, I mean, sure, there are there are nationalist uh, Christians and there are Christians who who acknowledge these things, um, but Christianity as a religion, uh, you know, qua religion, it it is universalist, and that's I think part of my rejection of it. Well, okay, do you do you reject? the idea that the world was better off when we were really and truly in charge. Uh, wait, <laughs> do I reject that the idea do was better? you reject better? the idea that the, basically our mission to Christianize the world. Oh, I see what you mean. Uh, led to oh, the, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, there are things like, you know, the Mesoamerican culture and its annihilation by, say, Cortez and Pizarro. I, you know, I could go either way on that. I actually have a genuine admiration and respect for Mesoamerican culture, uh, but I also have a genuine respect for the uh, conquistadores. I, I see both sides of it. Yes, I, I, if we're not I was, playing zero sum game this, and I have yeah. to take sides. <laughs> I, I was, I was writing about this just the other day that I, I've spent a great deal of time. My, my doctoral dissertation was actually on Mesoamerican uh, archaeology, but oh, it was I would heavily, like to read that then. Heav heavily infused with Dumazelian analysis and uh, comparison of uh, Dumazelian uh, functionalism uh, in, in Mesoamerican culture. But the way, the way I phrased it just the other day was, I have tremendous admiration for the Aztec and the Maya. Right. Uh, they, they, they created a very beautiful civilization. Absolutely. But my grandfather said the same Odin, Odin figure that I was talking about. Uh, he was deeply into everything uh, Arabic and Farsi uh, and Sufi. Uh, he uh, he he read he read both Arabic and Farsi, and uh, he was a leader of the Ku Klux Klan. Uh, he was a Klegal. 
was one of the best legals they ever had in the state of Texas. And, uh, you know, loving and being interested in other cultures does not mean that we want to be ruled by them. Right. It doesn't mean that we want to uh, subject a wee ally to uh, the treatment that uh, Muslim women get. Stop being overly gro grotesque about it. Uh, it doesn't mean that we really want to sacrifice our own children on blood altars the way Aztec, Maya, and in fact, quite a few ancient Western Semites did. And that's a whole different issue. But uh, child sacrifice was a huge thing in, in many parts of the world. Indo-European not being one of them. It's not one of the Indo-European traditions. Uh, and um, I just, I, I, I think that a lot of people, a lot of people have mixed the things up that if you study a non, non-Western religions, if you study non-Indo-European religions, uh, that you should accept them. And I, I don't think, I, I don't see that at all. I, I do not, I, as, 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 as many comparisons as I think you can make between uh, Azte Aztec and Maya and Greece and Rome, I would never want a bunch of Aztec or Maya taking charge of my life. Right. As, and, and, and in essence, that's what we're doing right now. Uh, we're, we're giving to foreigners dominion over our daily existence. And that is, it, 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 it is, uh, I mean, this, this, it, it does relate, I guess, to the analysis of evolution and the analysis of the, the JQ that, uh, we Eli and I were talking about the other night. Uh, that somehow one group, one group in the entire world seems to be taking charge of evolution right now and hence of human history. And I worry about paganism, that paganism is not as effective against uh, Judaism as Christianity because as I think Awiyali herself was saying the other night, there is nothing more anti-Jewish than the preachings of Jesus Christ. The problem, though, is that the vast majority of evangelical Christians do not perceive that. Um, well, while this is no, you, but you, you, you yourself said that there's this huge contradiction of, of, of evangelical fundamentalism of the Southern Baptist they believe that the Bible is true, but they manage to forget about half of it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd say if we're going by that logic, though, that we just need to side with the greatest threat to this group, uh, by that logic, why we, we should just convert to Islam, it seems, because, I mean, the, the Arab world, the Muslim world, uh, doesn't seem to have this same problem. And Islam is certainly not falling apart in the way that Western Christianity is. So, I mean, if we're going to embrace a religion on that fact uh, and on a, a unifying political religious ideology, then it seems like Islam is the way to go. If we're going to, yeah, just I think pick, that would be too hard on a wheel I think that yeah. would be too hard on a wheel on every every other woman. I agree with you. <laughs> But I think uh, knowing a wheel eye as well as I do, I think Christianity would be hard on her too. <laughs> to be fair. Oh, man. Well, I mean, again, that does present an inevitable problem that we face if we're just discussing in terms of the ideology, um, the scriptural context that does show the inherent corruptions of Judaism. It's there. But again, the problem is uh, the actions of the majority do not reflect those facts within the scriptural like proof that we have. It's not their actions do not reflect that. They do not want to acknowledge that. And as objective of a fact as it is, if they refuse to acknowledge that, demonstrate that in their 
actions, then essentially our discussion from the theoretical to the practical is being interrupted here. It's not, there's not a cohesive uh, conversion from the theoretical, from the ideology itself, which is of course uh, intrinsically oppositional from Christ's perspective uh, of Judaism to the practical in terms of the actions of the vast majority of Christians, especially in America. So, uh, I mean, there's a problem there because the actions of, the vast majority of Christians just are not consistent with that thesis, regardless of how accurate that thesis is. But how are we going to get a cohesive movement? I mean, you two are more similar probably than any other two people uh, <laughs> are to either of you. And yet you don't even have a complete religious identity between the two of you. Hmm. I don't think it's incomplete. I just think it's not symmetrical, maybe. I, I think, uh, I mean, we mesh perfectly fine. And I think that's kind of the message that, that I give to people is that I, you know, I think it's an a-religious question at this point as far as... But how do we, ignore, how do we organize? You know, like I had said at how the opening we... of, of your live stream here that by putting aside putting religion aside because like i said at the the outset here um you know you being christian i being pagan i i think at this point we all recognize that whether we call it european civilization or western civil or christian civilization it's all going down like the titanic and if we don't stop it we're all out of luck so you know i think the religious question if we're going to have it can come after we fix the ship here well, that, that, but the, the, the biggest question then is how do we motivate? I mean, you know, I, I have this feeling that uh, a Christian revitalization could succeed if we could get back up to the level of Christian devotion that people had even in the late 19th century or the middle 19th century, the 1850s. Uh, if we could even get back there, uh, you know, it would be a huge organizing principle for reclaiming the world. What else, what, 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 what alternative pro proposal do you have for motivating, motivating white people to come together? I mean, other than, other than, I mean, don't, 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 and don't tell me because if they'll just look at the facts, because obviously the facts are all out there. They're not looking at them. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. But I think, you know, speaking of the facts, I think the cat is out of the bag at this point. Uh, I think, you know, like we were talking about the, the fundamentalist aspect of Christianity, uh, most people, that's, that's kind of out the window at this point. I mean, people know about the contradictions in the Bible. They know about, uh, like you're talking about, the archaeological history of the Bible and how there were different uh, strands put together to form the Torah uh, people know all these things now, and it's difficult to kind of feign a, a religious faith when you already know. It's like, you know, I, I was a kid, you know, at one point, believe it or not, I was a little boy. And uh, I didn't believe in Santa Claus at one point. I just, I figured it out. Like I did a handwriting analysis between my dad's handwriting and Santa Claus's handwriting, figured it out. And I was in class one day, and uh, the teacher said, we're going to have a a letter writing competition. Whoever wins gets whatever. I, I won $300. But before that, I said, uh, you know, well, what if you don't believe in Santa? And the teacher said, well, then I guess you don't get the money, do you? So I had to fake that I believed in Santa. I won the letter writing contest. I won the $300 and I got my first television set. But I never actually believed in Santa Claus. I just did it to win the money. And I, you know, you, as much as you might want to believe that, kind of like the Polar Express, like you really want to believe and you want that magic back. After you've done the handwriting analysis, it's all over. You can't go back anymore. I guess again, the, the, this is this is my proposal, and it's something that maybe we can uh, pick up on in, in the future. But the essence of Christianity is militant love sounds like a contradiction doesn't it 
But uh, what Jesus means, to my mind, by that line that I, I quote on my, in my signature, signature block is that we must aggressively love. We must uh, affirm life in every possible way. Uh, we must affirm everyone, everyone's existence in every in every possible way. And I've I brought this up with one of the more every, every all the clergy in, in my in my church are, are left leaning, and so it's it's a very interesting uh, dialogue I have sometimes. But I've I've said to them. They, they, there's, there's this program inside the Episcopal Church called e-racism. And I get very aggravated whenever I hear that because, oh, you mean you want to erase the race that created this church? Yeah, I get it. Um, they said, no, 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 that's not what they meant. Um, anyhow, I posit that racism is love. Awiel, I was saying that uh, she sees the biggest problem in my quote as it fractures families. If a family is divided among its values, that family is going to fight. If a family is united in a single chapel, in a single, uh, in a single church, uh, in a single set of beliefs and prayers, that family is going to be united. I think that's what that really means, is that Jesus is saying, if you all love the kind of love I'm preaching, then you will be together. And if you do not, and for any, anyone who doesn't uh, follow that, that pattern of love, you know, you're going to fight. That's how I read that that particular passage, Matthew. And I do believe that love, that racism is love. And I, I totally turn the whole argument upside down on the people who attack us. And I, racism is just love of extended family. And that basically it's it is a hierarchical thing because you do love your own family more than you love you, you love your immediately family more than your cousins you love your cousins more than your di first cousins more than your distant cousins uh and it, it goes on that way and, and it, i guess i kind of feel like the beauty of 19th century europe was this concept of the white man's burden and the idea that the best way we could care for the rest of the world was by conquering them. And the worst thing we could do was what we did in the 1950s and 60s, which was to abandon Africa. Uh, we basically condemned Africa to a really horrible cycle of overpopulation and uh, impoverishment that Africa never experienced before. And yeah, it's can, not, it's, it was not colonialism that did it. It was decolonization that did it. Right, yeah, the same thing happened, uh, De Gobineau points out in the inequality of human races, the same thing happened in Haiti. He points out the difference between Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, points out that when you know Napoleon freed all the slaves, uh, it went straight downhill. Uh, the fact that uh, they decolonized this as a matter of French policy because of, you know, fraternity and equality and all that, uh, it totally destroyed the entire culture, the entire civilization. Uh, same thing happens everywhere that becomes decolonized. And that's just a really uncomfortable fact that academics don't like to talk about. We allow your, your thoughts on colonialism. <laughs> Well, of course, I share a very similar sentiment, and that is that it is one of those very uncomfortable truths that people really don't want to discuss. I mean, my God, we just saw recently 
uh, that one of the top scientists that was actually involved in the discovery of many of the most prominent biological revelations that we've ever had was recently um, essentially demonized and had all of his titles stripped from him because he insisted that there are intrinsic differences, particularly regarding IQ, uh, between different racial demographics. And that is something that uh, political propaganda in this day and age does everything it can to censor and to silence, but it's the truth. And it is a fact that colonialism has, uh, well, to put it bluntly, uh, saved demographics that otherwise could not save themselves. And the absence of that, to have that, that contingency upon colonialism and to have these developments and then to have that abruptly removed uh, definitely creates a system of absolute chaos. And it's, it's terrible. So... And of course, it's arguable that the whole point of World War II was to create that chaos. Right. World War World Wars One and, and Two were aiming at destabilizing the really the the pinnacle of of Christian civilization or the pinnacle of Western civilization. Uh, I mean, it's it's hard to beat the late nineteenth nineteenth and early twentieth century in terms of the stability and peace of the world, isn't it? Sure. Yeah, for the audience, I'd also recommend Churchill, Hitler, and the Unnecessary War by Pat Buchanan. It goes into that a lot. That, uh, you know, it was Churchill's actions directly that led to the total disintegration of the British Empire because of World War II. And it was because of the end of World War II that all colonial powers started withdrawing and the world basically collapsed. And it was by design. Well, and, the, and it was it was expressly designed in the in the documents leading up to uh, first insisting on un unconditional surrender of Germany, and uh, second the uh, the creation of the United Nations. So very expressly, it's true. Anyhow, this has been an amazing evening. Uh, we've been on for almost two hours, and. Uh, I have the feeling a wheel is going to tell me that she has to be up at five o'clock in the morning or something. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> okay. Well, then we should let you. We should definitely let you get some shut eye before that happens, because if you if you fall asleep in six minutes, you'll have exactly eight hours before five. <laughs> <laughs> Augustus Invictus, I just, I want to tell you I wanted to ha have a conversation with you for a very long time. Uh, I'm so happy that you were you were here tonight. And yes, sir. Uh, happy to be here. I'm going to give you my phone number too all fair when I figure out how this thing works. <laughs> oh, you can, 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 you, can you just text it to me? Uh, uh, yeah, sure. If you, if, I don't have your phone number though, so <laughs> that might be difficult. I can send it to you. Okay. Uh, I, I, can, I, can, I, I can give it to you right now. I mean, all sorts of people call me. It doesn't matter. Eric, could 504. Uh, well, I'm going to need to open the phone first. Hold on one second. All right, 504. I'll I'll type it just for in the in the in, in the interests of uh, some kind of pr prudence here. Yeah, probably a good idea. Okay, I've got it here. Thank you. Sure thing. Anyhow, thank you for thank you for your time, both of you. Uh, Augustus, can I can I disclose that you're somewhere in the state of Florida? Uh, I'm actually not. I'm in the South. I'm basically omnipresent in the South. You're omnipresent in the South. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you ran you ran for Senate. Uh, that was when I talked to you, actually. You were running for Senate in, uh, in Florida, right? Yes, sir. I was running for the U.S. Senate in Florida. My, well, I mean, I'm, I'm in Florida in the sense that my business is in Florida, my residence is in Florida, my family's in Florida. I'm, I'm physically not present in Florida at the moment. I, I oh. travel around a lot. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, Aweelai, of course, is, a, is in the Roman Senate meeting in Honolulu right now. Absolutely. There's no place I would rather be. So. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, good night, everybody. Uh, this is Charles Lincoln signing off from New Orleans, Louisiana. Everybody knows where I am <laughs> at all times. And uh, Augustus, uh, will you be able to join me, uh, you, you think, tomorrow at 530? I actually have a show to do at Heel Turn at 6.30. So I could. It would just have to be an hour show. If Bill that's Johnson all, never uh, does more than half an hour, 45 minutes anyway. Great. I'm That'd there. Yes, okay. sir. Are we alive? What are you doing? 
I do have work tomorrow, but I should be getting off earlier in the day, so that should be fine. I should be able to be. Okay. Uh, let's re let's reconvene. That'll be four thirty four thirty Central Time. Okay. Good night, everybody. Right. We, we we'll meet again. I know exactly where. I know exactly when. <laughs> good night, everybody. Have a good night. Oh, by the way, Augustus, one 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 final question. Yes, sir. You must know the answer to this off, off the top of your head. Is today the Ides of January? Is it? Uh, let me let me look at my phone here. My phone is in Latin. Uh, yes, it is. Yes, yeah, the fifteenth. So we are okay. at the Ides. Okay, so two 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 months to go to the Ides of March. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Talk to you tomorrow. Good night.